Hey, fourth graders. Wow, things are really exciting now. We have the Enchantress confronting her old fairy. I'm going to call them friends, family. Um, and we're really getting to the bottom of where this all started, all of her hatred. Um, let's just dig in and see where this takes us and how the twins are going to figure out um, to put a part of the Enchantress into the wand. Okay, thank you, Little Brown Books Publishing Company, for letting us do this online. All right, so here we go. You're the ones who renounced me long before I ever did, as Mia said as she glared at the rest of them. You ignored me, excluded me, and hated me from the minute I arrived. The world may be convinced that you had nothing to do with my change of career, but I'll always know the truth. You made it impossible for me to be anything but disliked. The Enchantress ran a finger along the arm of her old chair, remembering remembering all the painful memories of her time as a fairy. The cruelest thing you could do to someone is to force them to hurt all alone. And you left me hurting on my own many times, as Mia said. Every time I was heartbroken, I would go to the rest of you hoping to receive any kind of compassion. But you let your jealousies get in the way of showing me any sympathy. You actually enjoyed watching me suffer, relishing the first time that something distressed me. Emerel, um, yeah, Emeralda surprised the Enchantress and the other fairies with what she said next. She didn't deny this. I admit that even we were guilty of being less than perfect at times. Uh, but as we have grown from our mistakes, your mistakes have just grown. Good play on words there, don't you think? Esmia uh, snorted and slowly clapped in Emeralda's direction. Touche, the enchantress said. You managed to admit you were wrong and scold me all in one breath. Hmm, you're good at the leadership thing, Em. No wonder they replaced me with you. I was not a replacement, she said. You were never what this council needed. Ooh. No, I was never what this council wanted. Big difference, as Mia said sharply. They chose you, Emeralda, because you are more beautiful. And the world always listens to a pretty face over an average one. And even though I changed my appearance and gained beauty over time, they still chose you over me because you were easier to control. You were the fairy godmother's puppet one I could never be. Emeralda returned her scornful stare. Well, I'd rather be a toy than a tyrant, she said. But I'm assuming you didn't come here to reminisce. So what brings you back to the kingdom? Ha, huh. a small grin appeared on the enchantress's face. She was delighted to get a rise out of the fairies. Well, the truth is I've become rather bored waiting for you and the other rulers to gradually hand their kingdoms over to me, as Mia said, taking a seat on her old chair. So I've decided to invite them all to the new home I'm building for myself and get it all over with. I'm so anxious for this whole thing to conclude as much as you all are. None of us are going anywhere with you, Xanthia said, and his flames rose. Ah, a cunning smirk grew on the Enchantress's face. Ah, yes you are. It's not an option. The Enchantress snapped her fingers and the ground started to rumble with the power of a dozen earthquakes. All the fairies looked to one another, petrified of what was coming their way. Ah, uh, um, chasers, vines exploded out of the floor and seized the fairies in the room. They desperately tried to free themselves, struggling against the vines, struggling against the plants with all their might and all their magic. But it was no use. The plants were way too strong to escape. Esmia roared with laughter as she watched the vines coil around each fairy council member and drag them to the ground. Emeralda sank her hands into the ground to prevent the vines from dragging her away. You won't win, Esmia, she declared. Oh, 
but I will, the enchantress said, looking down at her with another smile in her eye. You see, I'm finally building my own pedestal, but this time, rather than admiration, I'm building it from rock, root, and rage. Scary. Well, things were gloomy as ever at the Charming Palace. All the other rulers had gone home from the happily ever after assembly meeting except Sleeping Beauty, who had no choice but to stay. She sat with Cinderella in her chambers, quietly comforting the uh, dis distraught mother. It's become almost two weeks since that horrible woman took my daughter away from me, Cinderella said. I never thought I could feel like this inside. I never thought I could be so miserable. Sleeping Beauty dabbled the tears spilling from her friend's tired eyes. You have to stay strong, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty said to her friend. We have to be brave for our people. Oh, Cinderella blew her nose into a handkerchief. But who is supposed to be brave for us at a time like this? She asked. Well, when the rest of the world is looking to us for strength and guidance, who do we look up to for reassurance? Hmm, who do they? Sleeping Beauty gently took Cinderella's hand in her own. We've got to inspire each other, she said. Cinderella patted her friend's hand and placed her head on Sleeping Beauty's shoulder. There was a knock at the door. Come in, Cinderella said. Hmm, Sir Lampton. Stepped into the queen's chambers. His face was so long, the queen knew he was bringing bad news. What is it, Sir Lampton? Cinderella asked, bracing herself for whatever it was. More bad news, I'm afraid, Your Majesty. I just received a letter from Sir Grant in the Northern Kingdom. Apparently, the Enchantress attacked the Northern Kingdom last night after attacking Troll and Goblin territory. They woke up this morning to discover all their crops were poisoned. Oh, dear goodness, Sleeping Beauty said and placed a hand on her chest. Does that Enchantress have no soul at all? Queen Snow White has asked that we send what we can, Lampton said. Well, yes, yes, of course, Cinderella said. Gather as much food as the kingdom can spare. The ground under the palace began to shake. Cinderella's chamber rattled as something moved through the palace towards the chamber. What on earth, Lampton said, staring down at the floor. As it began to crack under his feet, he retrieved his sword, although it was really useless against whatever was coming. Vines burst through the floor and slithered up to the Queen Cinderella and Queen Sleeping Beauty. They wrapped themselves around them and dragged them back from where they had come from. Sir Lampton tried rescuing the queens, but it all happened so quickly he was unable to prevent it. He looked through the cracks in the floor and could see the vines dragging the screaming queens several floors through the palace and into the ground where they disappeared out of sight. The ground began to rumble again, this time not from something directly below the palace, but from something much further in the distance. Lampton ran over the cracks to a window to see what was causing this commotion. <sighs> Miles away in the northern part of the charming kingdom, a gargantuous pillar made of rock, roots, and dirt emerged from the ground and rocketed into the air. The land cracked and elevated unevenly for miles and miles around it. But the pillar grew higher and higher, only stopping once it had reached the clouds. A massive coliseum was on the top of the pillar, constructed of enormous jagged stones shaped like arrowheads. Vines and thorn bushes grew up the sides of the pillar, taking with them all the rulers they had seized from around the world. The enchantress, of course, sat in the center of this coliseum on her old fairy council chair, like it was a throne. The plants arrived with, uh, arrived with her two new guests and pinned them around 
to the walls at various locations. <sighs> the abducted kings, queens, and fairies were now prisoners in Esmia's vengeful, earthy web. Hmm. True to her word, the enchantress had built herself a pedestal made of the deepest parts of the earth, powered by the deepest anger of her soul. Oh my goodness. Ugh, creepy. Woo! Chapter 26, the enchantress's... Well, oh, this is what we're waiting for. Most prized possession. What is it? Like, I, I don't have any idea. Well, the ground began to tremble and quake under the campsite. What's happening? Oh, we're back to Connor now. Um, it's the Enchantress, Alex screamed. She's starting her final attack. As if tiny explosions were being set off around the campsites, um, bouquets of devilish vines burst through the ground and slithered through the site. They knocked over tents and people as they moved, as if they were still searching for something. What do you think? Jack and Goldilocks immediately drew their weapons and began slicing the demonic plants, but there were just too many of them to fight off. Help! Help! Somebody was yelling. The twins heard a high-pitched scream behind them, turned around, and saw the vines tangling around Red and attempting to drag her back into the ground with them. Please, somebody help! Jack and Froggy both ran to her, throwing themselves on the ground and reaching a hand towards her. Red was almost all the way underground. Only one hand was free. She looked to Jack and she looked to Froggy. If there, these were the last moments of her life, well, she had to decide right then and there with whom she wanted to spend them. With... Just at that moment, Red grabbed hold of Froggy's hand. He was shocked to see her hand land in his. Red gasped and grasped hold of Froggy's hand. You chose me, Froggy said, looking into her eyes. Both of them recognized the significance of the moment. Yes, yes, I choose you, Red said, and a very small smile appeared on her face. She pulled him closer and kissed his slimy green lips, not repulsed by his appearance or texture whatsoever. The vines climbed over Red and began wrapping around Froggy. Jack grabbed hold of one of his legs and Goldilocks grabbed the other. The vines, though, were just too strong for them to pull Froggy and Red free. But Jack and Goldilocks were not going to give up. The vines moved past Froggy and began growing around the whole group, pulling all four of them towards the ground. Well, can they be of more use if they're all underground together? Maybe they should let go and go. So as Alex and Connor were on their way to help, they heard another cry. Butterboy! Tobella yelled from across the camp. The vines had wrapped around her and were dragging her into the ground as well. Oh, Connor grunted and looked around. Can someone else please save Trebella? But all the other trolls and goblins were too afraid of the vines to go near her. Please save me, butter boy, Trebella cried. Oh, okay, fine, I'm coming, Connor yelled. So he and Alex changed their course and ran for the young troll queen instead. Connor grabbed Trebella's, Trebella's hand and Alex grabbed Connor's feet. They tried to pull her free, but the vines, guess what, were too strong. Are they all going to get pulled underground here? Kind of seems like it. This would be so romantic if it weren't for the possessed plants pulling us apart, butter boy, Trebella whispered dreamily into Connor's ear. Oh dear. The vines began to creep past Trebella and onto Connor, pulling him in with her. Alex, you've got to let go of me, Connor yelled behind himself. You can't let the vines get you. I'm not letting you go, Connor, Alex yelled back. You have to save the fairy tale world, Alex, Connor said. You have to save the other world and mom too. Well, big decision. Alex's grip around her brothers 
feet tightened. I can't save anything without you, she said. Yes, you can. It was always meant to be you. Wow, so many decisions to make here. You're the one who got us here, and you're the one who's going to get us out. You heard the ghost. You're the heir of magic. You've got to defeat the enchantress so the world can go on. At this point, the vines had wrapped almost completely around Connor. Alex was shaking her head profusely. I can't do it alone, she said, terrified to lose him. Yes, you can, Connor said. I'm really sorry about this. And then Connor kicked Alex off of him and the vines consumed him entirely. The vines dragged him and Trabella down into the ground and they disappeared. And of course, Alex screamed, Connor! But it was no use. He was gone. Is she on her own now? Who's left? Alex looked across the camp just in time to see the vines pull Red, Froggy, Jack, and Goldilocks into the ground with one final heave. As soon as Trabella, Red, and the others clinging on to them had been taken, all the vines in the campsite disappeared into the ground. They had only come for the queens. Alex got to her feet and looked around in shock. In a matter of minutes, all of her friends and her brother had been taken. She had no choice but to finish the quest alone. It was all up to her now. But Bob is still around. Bob ran up to Alex. Where have they been taken? Alex was wondering the same thing. She looked down at the large cracks the vine had left in the ground. They weren't just in the campsite, but they were stretched off into the distance as if the vines had left marks on their way to and from their destination. I've got to go, Alex said, and she ran to the tent and retrieved the wand of wonderment. She placed it in the troll's satchel and threw it over her shoulders. Alex ran off into the distance, following the cracks in the ground as if maybe they were a trail.